Greetings and welcome to Real Politics. This is James Tracy. Is it possible to change the world through satire? Before passing judgment, consider how a genuinely comedic mind can direct their audiences to the underlying hypocrisies of everything from processed food to their government's foreign policy maneuvers and generate laughter in the process. A satirist true to his craft must strike a chord between the mundane and the sublime, helping us see the world in a way we've failed to consider. Our guest on this hour uh, devoted his life to satire almost 60 years ago. For 34 of those years, he's been better recognized as the manager of a non-existent heavy metal band than as the highly talented and influential writer who has shaped the contours of contemporary humor. Tony Hender was educated at Cambridge, not Harvard. Through unusual circumstances, he was directed in his teen years to the monastery, training to become a Benedictine monk. This fascinating story is laid out in his 2004 book, Father Joe, The Man Who Saved My Soul. As an editor of National Lampoon in its heyday, Tony Hendra also developed a distinctly irreverent brand of satire while nurturing such talents as John Belushi, Chevy Chase, and Christopher Guest. He is the author of several books. I mentioned Father Joe. Uh, in addition, Going Too Far, a history of post-1950s anti-establishment humor. And he's a former editor of Spy Magazine as well. He was a major force behind George Carlin's sort of biography, Last Words. Hendra is presently editor-in-chief and founder of the Final Edition Comedy Ensemble, which he heads up with comedian Jeff Chrysler. They have just released uh, the first National Lampoon comedy album in 35 years, titled Are There Any Triggers Here Tonight? Additional information is available over at their website, thefinaledition.com. Uh, welcome, Tony. Great. Great to be here, James. I'm very happy to uh, to have you on the program, needless to say. And I kind of wanted to begin by going back uh, to the late 1950s, early 1960s, uh, when your life took a turn after you saw a uh, comedy performance at Cambridge University called Beyond the Fringe. Yes, well, um, Beyond the Fringe um, probably changed a, a, a lot of... Um, post-war young minds like mine. Um, what it was was um, a review, a, a theatrical review, um, which was done by um, a, a, a group, uh, a, a quite old group in, in Cambridge called Footlights, which had been going on for about 150 years, and um, a similar group in Oxford. Um, and uh, two, two guys from Cambridge and two guys from Oxford put together this review. Uh, the guys were Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, and um, Alan Bennett and Jonathan Miller. Um, and the significant thing about Beyond the Fringe was that it was the first time that um, satirical minds had assembled in one place all the sort of sacred goods of our fusty old empire, uh, our fusty old British empire, um, everything you could think of from, from Shakespeare to World War II, in, including the monarchy, um, parliament, uh, uh, practically anything that, that, that had to do with the British Empire's history um, and uh, public schools and, and the Church of England and so forth. And it assembled all these sacred goods in one place, um, one review, and eviscerated them. Um, and eviscerated them in a way that, that never had been done before and, and possibly never ever done before. So it was um, incredibly funny, hilariously funny, and it was a real mind changer. I must say, in, when when I went to see it um, at that uh, in 1960, um, as, uh, as as a very pious young man who was preparing himself to enter a monastery, um, and as I say in my book, I went into that theatre a monk, and I came out a satirist, <laughs> and. Um, <laughs> And and that's um, that that really was the start of my of my my taste for and love of satire. And you began on the comedy performance circuits in the early 1960s. Is that correct? Uh, 
Well, I yes, I, I, I joined the same when I went when I was at Cambridge after that experience. I was, I was in my first year at Cambridge when that happened. But um, after that, I sought out this uh, this wonderful group called Footlights, which uh, uh, at that time was going through a, a kind of golden period. Um, obviously, the two Cambridge guys, Peter Cook and Jonathan Miller, had uh, had attended for had belonged to Footlights, I should say. And um, at the uh, at the year I entered it, um, the year before, David Frost had been the president of Footlights and was was ready to go down and start. That was the week that was in London on the BBC, and um, I was actually a contemporary of. John Cleese and Graham Chapman of later of Monty Python, mm-hmm. and um, a host of other people who became sort of um, actually known in, in comedy circles in England as, as the Cambridge Mafia, uh, including um, people like um, uh, Bill Oddy and uh, Tim Brooke Taylor and other people who are who are megastars in England. Um, so it was quite a it was quite a crop of uh, quite quite a crop of talent to be, to be one of. Now, what was it like beginning in England and then coming to the United States? H- how did audiences differ in their sensibilities, their expectations of what comedy was supposed to be and perhaps anticipating its change? H- how did you see that from the stage? Well, um, there, there were, I would say there were regional differences which we weren't aware of when we we got off the boat. We... Uh, was a comedy team that I, I founded um, with a, with another Footlights member called Nick Hullett. Uh, although my first partner was Graham Chapman, and we, and we did very well. It was the only time in my life when I was the straight guy. Um, and um, we, um, but anyway, we, my partner and I, Nick Hullett and Tony Hendra, um, uh, was the name of our team, um, arrived on the shores in very early 1964 in, in New York City. And um, New York was remarkably um, hospitable to our, to what we had to offer, which I would say, in in a word, was bargain basement beyond the fringe. Um, to we 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 did sort of sit down comedy on stools and did sketches, satirical sketches about uh, the kind of things that were current in those days, like uh, like the, the the monarchy and Harold Macmillan's government and so on. Um, so in New York, for the most part, we found people who had some clue what we were talking about. Um, but um, when we went further afield, um, our first booking um, actually was uh, opening for Lenny Bruce um, at, the, at the Cafe of Gogo, um, which was turned out to be the end of his career. He was busted twice during that during that run, and uh, we were present right there on the stage when the NYPD went up on stage and arrested him both times. Um, and, um, but that audience was, was, was quite, was quite attuned to what we, what we were doing. And, um, and, 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 but, but, the, but the second booking we had, uh, was in, um, was in early 1964 in Dallas. And, um, this of course was just three and a half months after the assassination. Huh. Um, and we, this, but, but it wasn't really that which, um, which, which affected our reception there. It was really that, that people just had no clue what we were talking about when we, um, when we, uh, spoke about the Queen. In fact, the only, the only thing that triggered, was triggered by, by us doing a sketch about the Queen, uh, was that, um, we began to be heckled at, because the audience decided we were queers. And um, it, it uh, was quite, <laughs> quite, quite a strange experience. And the first, the first show of the night, we um, we were we were actually fired after our first show. Uh, but we begged not to be fired because then we'd be we, the, the immigration would send us back to New, back to England. Um, so um, in between shows, we worked out uh, what we felt was going to go down well. Um, which um, consisted basically of um, Beatles songs and um, queer jokes. And we came back and explained that, that we, we actually were queer, and so this is what we were going to do. And we brought the house down and were renewed for two weeks and with a talk of Dallas for, you know, that time. 
so that was that was how we kind of adapted and also the kind of response we got um when we you know when we when we first were exposed to american audiences and uh, lenny bruce uh, just observing him I, I think that you uh mentioned in the foreword to george carlin's last words that he was someone that uh most comedians looked to and wanted to be when they grew up um Yes, certainly. Certainly, the comedians of, of my generation uh, were idolized, um, idolized Lenny Bruce, um, in part because of his courage. I mean, he just he just decided he wanted to talk about certain things in a certain way, and and didn't step back from that. And um, and of course, it was his undoing, um, especially in New York, where ironically for me, he was pursued by Catholics uh, pretty much into his grave. And but yes, so, but but Lenny, Lenny, I hate to call him Lenny because lots of people who never met Lenny Bruce call him Lenny. But what the hell, I actually knew him. <laughs> um, but he was he was um, he was really responsible in many ways, uh, along with obviously other influences like Mort Saul and Second City. But he was really re- responsible, the spearhead, the, the free, the, the First Amendment uh, tester. Uh, for all of us who, who, who came after him and, um, and I either took or took the label satirist or, or the, um, or decided what they were doing was comedy. But yes, he was immensely, immensely influential and, and important. And it was extraordinary to sit on stage and, and just listen to him, um, uh, listen to him live. I must say, we, he, he, we already, both my partner and I already idolized this guy from his albums. He, he couldn't be, um, he, you couldn't see him live in England because the Home Secretary had banned him from the country. In fact, had him deported uh, after after doing a show at a place called The Establishment owned by Peter Cook in Soho. And, um, but uh, we, were, we were just uh, complete super fans of his. Now, your uh, mother's maiden name is McGovern, M C G O V E R N. Uh, I'm not sure as to whether or not she actually owned up at any point in your life to being Irish. Uh, she always asserted that she was Scottish. Yes, um, that, that was my mother. My mother was um, was actually raised in Scotland, although both her parents came from um, from Ireland, um, and um, and she w- was not unlike. Um, Quite a number of people of Irish extraction um, in England at that time who, uh, who 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 did not want to be recognised as Irish because mm-hmm. the the the, the, uh, the British um, British odium towards the, towards the Irish was really quite uh, quite uh, horrific. Um, I mean, when I was a kid, I was routinely I was routinely um, st- had stones thrown at me on my way home from school just because I was a Catholic and that was code for basically code for, for being Irish. Mm-hmm. Um, so my mother, um, did, did, insisted that we were Scottish, um, all, all my life, uh, until I was about, um, and actually until, until I came to America and realized that McGovern was an ex- incredibly common Irish name. And yeah. then I started to dig back and, and realized that, yeah, I actually, um, this, this big Celtic mug that I sport. Is um, is actually from Ireland, and, um, and my and my father for, 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 for actually was to, to make 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 me totally Celtic, one hundred percent, was from Cornwall. So I was I'm basically Cornish and Irish. Have nothing to do with the British at all. <laughs> do you think that <laughs> uh, growing up in England as a, a stealth Irish Catholic? I mean, you were your Catholicism was was uh out there but not your irishness necessarily that was something that was cloaked i think about that i think about george carlin uh and also about so many comic minds who were jewish and i bring this up because um the jewish and and, and as well as the, the the catholics uh particularly in your climate where you grew up in england saw themselves as outsiders and thus may have recognize some of the contradictions that others might not really see, which really suited them especially well for comedy. Right. Well, I mean, I think uh, certainly the outsider 
status which being Irish gave you in England if if you if you live there, uh, and it, it is 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 always a, a very good spur to having a, a let's say ironic view of the of the establishment. Um, and certainly one of the um, one of the great influences on my generation, um, even before Beyond the Fringe, was was a wonderful show, a wonderful surrealistic uh, radio show called uh, The Goon Show. Um, and the Goon Show was was had a remarkable cast. Um, it was it consisted of a guy called Harry Seacombe, who was Irish, and um, and uh, I believe, and and um, and and but, but most importantly, a, a guy called Spike Milligan, um, who was um, who was obviously Irish, and and, uh, and 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 just had this incredibly insane sense of humor. Um, one of the things that they were very, very um, prone to do was to make fun of World War II. And, and this was in the early 50s in England. In other words, the war was still very fresh in everyone's memory. And, you know, very few of the bomb sites had been cleaned, cleaned up yet. But they, they, they went to town on that and did hilarious things about fooling Hitler by floating a cardboard model of England out into the English Channel. Um, and, and routines like that, you can only do on radio. Uh, and they, they, they really, they really pr- probably shaped us at an even profounder level than, than beyond the French. But yeah, I mean, being Irish it, it, from Oscar Wilde, da- Oscar Wilde down or up, uh, whichever, however you want to see history, um, is, um, it has certainly been the, the sort of honored status of, the, the the outsider, except you have to keep being funny. You can't stop being funny. But then they turn on you. But um, but but I'm sure that I'm sure that had a, a great deal to do with my my early attraction to uh, to to this form of expression. And you've been a a writer for for many years, an author. Uh, when did the the idea of of Father Joe? The man who saved my soul arise. Was it always your intent to put together a memoir? Did you recognize this story as having special significance? Of, you know, back in the eighties or seventies, perhaps. Well, it was a story which, um, depending on the audience, I tended to keep to myself because it wasn't it wasn't something that went down particularly well in the in the sixties and early seventies. Um, to have wanted to be to, to have wanted to be a Catholic monk, but. Um, but it was a story which, I, when, when I trusted people around the dinner table, I had told many times um, it, little bits and pieces of this of this remarkable man that I had been lucky enough to know as a kid. Um, but I never really thought of telling the story until he died, and um, and I realized not that I really needed his death to realize it, but when people who are that close and important to you and to your whole uh, well, soul, for want of a better term, um, actually pass away and the universe no longer contains them, then you do have a different level of realization of exactly what they meant to you. So it, it was at that point, really, that I decided that I would pull all these little memories and stories and, 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 the, and the basic story of how I turned from being a holy man to being an unholy man um, uh, into 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 action into an actual book. So it was um, it, it was it wasn't until the nineties, in other words, that I actually considered telling that story in public. And the way that it's told, it, it is able to capture uh, so many moments and exchanges, conversations, dialogues with Joe, uh, as well as you know, moments, chapters of your life in such a crystal clear way. And I'm curious to know what the writing process of that book was like. Uh, was there meditation perhaps involved? It, it just, you seem to hone in on particular things and capture their essence uh, in a very, very uncanny way, uh, in a very descriptive way. You mean in my own life or, or, or it sort of objective things? Well, the recollections uh, from your own life in Father Joe. Right. 
Well, I mean, it, it was it was a fascinating process because uh, I, obviously I had this this little scrapbook of memories and 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 things that he had said to me that I remembered uh, all my life and and so on. But I I have to I have to say that when I actually sat sat down and planned out a book, um, I realized that there were huge holes in this in this narrative um, and that um, I couldn't. I didn't really have a source for them because, first of all, he was dead, um, and, and and secondly, um, it was a very old story, um, and 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 as as storytellers, all storytellers know, stories change as you tell them. So you 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 need to you need to fact check yourself when you actually start um, when you actually start writing a memoir, which it, which it, this was in, in part, um, but. I found a, a, a very interesting process, which probably makes makes is obvious to people, but but it was to go back to all the places that I could remember, and I mean literally places like actual places in the monastery where we had had some of our greatest talks, and I found a sort of quite amazing, almost magical process began to happen, which is that these conversations and or at least the the, the the core of conversations began popping back into my head i mean it was it was a remarkable experience actually uh, of being being inspired by by the faces and also uh, some of the monks who were still alive who uh, remembered Joe and remembered me when i'd been coming to the monastery who by then were very old um, but um uh, and, and, and even if they, even if they didn't actually mention anything that had to do with me, um, they, they said things which triggered, they said things about Joe, which triggered, um, other memories in me. And before I knew where I was, I actually had most of those gaping holes were beginning to be filled. And, um, it, it was, it was a quite extraordinary process, I must say. Now, what did your colleagues at National Lampoon think of you having been a monk? Is this something that came up at all, and what were those exchanges like? <laughs> well, the National Lampoon was was not the kind of was not the kind of um, place where you uh, uh, submitted to general scrutiny private things about your life, <laughs> because they would tend to get uh, whipped up in the shark, shark tank uh, in, in such a way that blood would soon be in the water. Um, so I didn't tell anybody very much except one person uh, who was uh, Sean Kelly, who was my uh, my co-editor for most of the time that I was there, because he also had, um, had had thoughts about being a priest and had been brought up by Jesuits rather than Benedictines. Um, so he um, he kept it to himself. Luckily, he didn't keep much to himself, but um, he, he he did keep that to himself. But so I didn't really uh, I didn't really um, uh, didn't really share it with 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 the with the group at large. But I did um, but I did partake in something that's quite significant of the National Lampoon, I think, which was the fact that we did Catholic humor and did it. With great glee and and with absolutely no bounds, um, which I think was something very new on the um, on the American satirical scene. Um, in fact, the only person that I knew who'd done anything of the kind that we went into, which was things like Son of God comics, which featured a gigantic uh, superhero who was actually Jesus. Um, fighting the Pope of Rome, his great his great enemy, um, and um, and and various other Catholic subjects. But I, it, I, the only person I I could identify who'd ever done anything like that was Tom Lehrer, who obviously isn't Catholic, and um, but had done things like the Vatican Rag and and some other wonderful satirical songs about about the Church. Um, so I think that was one of the things. Since there are an awful lot of Catholics in. Um, in the United States, that that helped propel the the lampoon into the enormous circu circulation that it that it enjoyed at the time. Since you were there on the ground level at National Lampoon, uh, at a time when it was at its most vibrant, I think, and challenging 
conventions more so than perhaps any other outlet. Really the first multimedia, I think, comedy outlet, it's fairly safe to say as well, since uh, it ventured into recordings, uh, radio, uh, in addition to print and eventually cinema. What was a day in the life like for an editor, for the managing editor at National Lampoon? So, I'm sorry, James, I don't quite understand the question. I, 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 you, what, what are you asking exactly? What, I'm, I'm was, what was it like? What was everyday life like at the National Lampoon? I would imagine. Oh, what was it like? I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. That, that didn't mean, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, well, it was, um, it, it was um, certainly at the outset, um, for me, it was, it was an extraordinary um, a sort of elementally, elementally a discovery that I had never dreamed of. Um, I had been doing, um, I had been doing uh, American television. Uh, I, I, I hate to say American television, but American television in the late 1960s, especially in comedy, was fairly horrific. Uh, it was mostly centered on these huge variety shows, where you know you you literally couldn't say anything about anything. Um, outside the studio, um, except maybe your own family and maybe, um, uh, you know, some crazy idea that you'd had about American history. But anything to do with sex, drugs, rock and roll, liberation, um, uh, and, and, uh, and above all, of course, the war in Vietnam it was just uh, was completely off limits. Mm -hmm. So it was extraordinary. And, I, and I'd been suffering through this. I mean, Colin, actually, my friend George, went through the same kind of thing and, and, and came to the same conclusion, which is he couldn't have any part of it. Uh, and that in order to be an artist uh, and, and do what you were born to do, you have to sort of break out of that and, and, and find some other way of expressing yourself in a more honest and authentic way. So it was um, walking into the lampoon was like, you know, I'd been firing on one cylinder um, for, for, for five or six years and make, certainly making a very good living, but firing on one cylinder and suddenly I was firing on all six and it, it really was that the, you know, the sun came through the clouds. I mean, it was, it was, it was amazing. And they were such a, uh, such a verbal group that, um, which I also loved. And, and so everything, practically every conversation that took place within the lampoon, once you went to work, as we laughingly called it, um, in, in, in the, in the early seventies was, if not, um, if not actually destined to end up in the, in, in the, in the magazine of a caliber. I mean, the, the repartee was of a caliber that, um, that, um, that, that, that any, any chunk of it could have been uh, taken and, 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 you know, turned into words or pictures and, and, and run in the magazine. I mean, it was that, it was that, it was that terrific. So it was just enormous fun. I mean, it didn't, it wasn't fun forever as nothing is, but um, but certainly for those first two years that I was there, seventy one, seventy two, and into seventy three, it was um, uh, it was just uh, a joy uh, for me. But a joy, obviously, in which you were also tearing down sacred goods, literally, <laughs> literally by the day. And Carl Bernstein, I believe, once remarked to you that uh, the National Lampoon helped bring down the Nixon administration. Yes, his, his actual quote was, which he told me on the on the phone. This is this many years afterwards when he became a friend of mine. But he he said, um, yeah, he said, uh, if it hadn't been for the National Lampoon, we would never never have been able to force Nixon to resign. Um, and I think he was, you know, I think he was partly being a, a sort of funny friend, but I think also he was he was dead serious. I mean, I think we created an atmosphere, um, especially in our own generation where Nixon was just toxic to the point of being impossible. And um, and I'm very glad we did. Got rid of two criminals, two criminals in one. <laughs> do, do you think National Lampoon would have perhaps followed a different trajectory of developments if Gerald Ford or Ronald Reagan were elected in 1976? What an interesting question. Never thought about that. Um, I think I certainly think if Ronald Reagan um, 
if Ronald Reagan had made it in 76, it might well have been that that was so, so extreme uh, at the time. Well, let me put this another way. I think it, I, let, let's put it another way. I think if Ronald Reagan had, 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 um, had succeeded in 1976, it would have been such a cornucopia of, of satire that the turn <laughs> the, um, the magazine took in, in the late 70s, um, definitely from left to right under P.J. O'Rourke, would possibly not have happened. It just wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been, um, it wouldn't have been commercially viable. I think we would have been immensely, immensely uh, lucky to have had Ronald Reagan. Um, I mean, in 1972, we actually formed a fake pack, which was called Satirists for Nixon Agnew, and it was basically keep them in office and <laughs> us in business. And, um, and, and I think that that would have applied in spades to Reagan. I'm not so sure about about Ford because uh, because he was such a he, he was such a sort of pale character, but um, but certainly it wasn't that we were it wasn't that we were Democrats. I don't think we were anything, um, and we certainly gave the Democrats and the left, especially the movement, our own left, our own generation's left, just as much hell as we gave the right. Um, but um, but certainly I think the the, the zeitgeist changed in such a way that. Uh, that um, the swing began in you know in the, in the Carter years, and, and it certainly began in the magazine too. Most unfortunate, I must say, because I and I fought long and hard to stop it, because I do think that the ma- the magazine could well have grown up um, with its audience in 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 the same way uh, that the New Yorker you know evolved with its audience from you know a young, frankly. 20s audience, it, 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 it grew up with its audience rather than insisting on remaining in one place, which is what O'Rourke did. Um, and, um, but it was a hard battle to fight because uh, a little movie had just come out called Animal House, and it seemed like that, the way, that was the way things were trending. That's a brief history of the National Lampoon in the 70s, James. <laughs> oh, thank you. What's, in your view, what are some of the problems that you see with with comedy today? Well, um, there's, there's a sort of generic one which I, which I I find kind of impossible to 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 combat in any way, but which is that which is that for, which is that largely speaking um, in comedy, um, we now have a sort of single crop uh, approach to. Um, to, to, to comedy and raising comedians, which is which is stand up, and stand up has become so universal as the route by which young people of either gender um, express themselves and 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 enter the comedic um, the comedic society, if you will, um, that it's um, that it's very hard to um, it's it's quite hard to establish any other kind. With any degree of um, currency, and and that's I find that rather frustrating. I mean, it's uh, stand-up comedy obviously has produced all kinds of geniuses, um, uh, Amy Schumer and, and and Sarah Silverman are obvious obvious current female ones, and uh, and Stewart and Colbert are, are, are perfectly great examples of. Um, of, of, of male of, of, of male achievements, but it's um, but it's um, it's still you know all of them uh, get to where they get to where they want to be by starting out as comedians, and I and I think I think stand-up comedy is is a very it's a fascinating form, but it is very solipsistic and it, it doesn't necessarily unless it's in the hands of someone like Carlin uh, and and a few others um, like him, it doesn't direct itself outward in a way that satire is almost obliged to do. Um, and, and, and that, I think, is, is, is a bit of a lack in the culture. Um, but that said, I mean, obviously there are other things which are affecting comedy, um, or at least the reception of comedy, um, even as, you know, the targets multiply. And um, it's uh, the, the campus, obviously the campus problem, which is which has arisen, uh, in the in in the um, in the teens, um, 
which is not a new one. It's the same thing. The same thing occurred in the 90s, um, and which is called political correctness, a term I loathe, but um, but but is it is is it's certainly rampant. I mean, it's speech codes and and ways of of, um, of of stamping out anything that that feels uh, offensive or is uh, unfortunately satirizing things that are offensive um, is is frustrating, and that's really what our new album is, is about. And you know, before we conclude our conversation, um, you, you do have, given your experience and breadth of professional experience, you touch so many lives and work with uh, so many other influential individuals, comedians, writers. Um, what was uh, what was your experience of, uh, of of John Belushi? You were someone. Oh, who, John. Yeah. Uh, John. John was um, was was really uh, one of a kind. I must say, um, <clears throat> the night I first saw Belushi, well, just a, a quick backstory. John um, was um, was made aware through the grapevine that uh, the National Lampoon was putting together uh, a stage show. And um, he uh, he was, I think, the only member of that cast of Lemmings um, the, who actually contacted me himself, which he did from Second City. And he sent me a tape um, of himself doing impressions um, of various people. And most of them were absolutely ghastly. They, they were like Brando and... and Brando was the Godfather and Truman Capote, and there was one that was beyond the brilliant, which was of Joe Cocker. And I knew when I had the first, the first two bars of his parody of Joe Cocker singing, um, "What would you do?" You know, uh, what was that song called? A few of my friends, I can't remember the yeah. title of the action, but but his his enormous mega hit. Um, and I, I knew that I had to see this kid, and uh, so I went to Second City. And I was blown away, and I'm very rarely blown away uh, by by John Belushi. Truly blown away. I mean, I I I I got up out of my chair and 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 uh, and, and applauded, which I, I don't think I've ever done an, an improvisation show. Uh, but he he just was. He first of all, he completely undercut the show. He completely subverted the show and just entered any sketch he felt like. But he was like this rolling bearded dynamo of comic energy. And, and 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 what I found sort of most interesting about him after doing Lemmings with him was that he wasn't just he wasn't just representative of this ferocious elemental force uh, that was rolling through comedy at the time and which which included many others uh, but none as none as pure as him um, but but well I wouldn't say that of, of, of but, but which included many others, like um, like Richard Pryor and and George Carlin, obviously. But he he also represented rock and roll. Uh, he represented the sort of hairiness and 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 lack of boundaries of rock and roll. So he was he was he was our generation sort of rolled up into one hairy ball of of, 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 of dynamic comedic energy. <laughs> amazing, amazing talent. And we haven't had a chance really to touch upon what you're best known for uh perhaps oddly enough and that is spinal tap you know um it's been such a wonderful conversation but i do want to touch on this briefly and i'm wondering if you know how many people do you believe or would you estimate actually realize that that was primarily improvisation the spinal tap itself i I, I, to this day, when I tell people that, it's um, that they sort of their jaws drop. Actually, uh, it's um, people can't believe that we improvised every every word of it. But um, but um, I, as I say, I, only real insiders know that know that it was improvised. Um, and it was um, it was what gave it. I think its authenticity was was the fact that it was, and that we were actually we were sort of. As a as a cast and, and 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 as representative of our generation, we were we were people who had sort of once in some form or another uh, loved rock and roll, and perhaps even believed in it a little bit in, in its messianic supposed messianic message. 
um, and had been cruelly disappointed, not just by the music, but especially by the industry that that owned the music and um, mm-hmm. and and the and the horrific things that they did with this with this gigantic amount of talent and promise. Um, so we were very ready to be those characters, so that you know, to be the. Uh, I mean, Fran Drescher was ready to be Bobby Fleckman. I was Bobby Fleckman. I was ready to be, you know, Andrew Lou Goldman and Peter Allen and all those other awful people who managed rock groups into the ground. Um, and so I think that gave that's what gave it its edge and its drive, really, um, and, and probably also its longevity. But I, 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 there is just one little story I should tell about this, though, in terms of of, of, um, of Spinal Tap fans, which is. Um, this happened in the late eighties when I was uh uh when I was in, in New York and when um Spinal Tap had sort of written the VHS phenomenon to become a, really quite a big sort of cult hit already by then. And um I was in a, a New York taxi and my driver was this um he was uh this kind of acid casualty, I mean a, a real a, a real hippie guy. Uh, with with hair down to his butt crack, and um, so this acid, acid casualty looks in his rearview mirror and he says, "Hey man, weren't you in that movie? That movie by uh, Rock and Roll group? And I said, "Yeah, Spinal Tap." And he said, "Yeah, yeah, Spinal Tap. Yeah, and and, and you're the band manager, right?" And uh, I said, "Yeah, yeah." He said, "Yeah." He's, 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 Groovy movie. Uh, you know, man, I, I knew Spinal Tap before they made that movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's classic. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> uh, uh, Tony Hendra, anyway. Tony Hendra, I, I, I'd like to thank you for being on the program. I really do appreciate it. And it's been a, a, a as far as I, on this end, it's been a wonderful conversation. Great. Well, I'm glad to be on it, and it's been a wonderful conversation from my side, too. Wonderful questions, and uh, great to be allowed to to speak forth so freely. Thank you. Yes, you're most welcome. And you can find more about Tony Hendra and his most recent project, thefinaledition.com. Uh, there's all sorts of material over there. Uh, there are uh, comedy skits. There are um, a variety of other things, you know, uh, news articles, mock news articles. And they just put out the new LP from National Lampoon, the first one in 35 years. Are there any triggers here tonight? Is there anything uh, additionally you'd like to add, Tony, about the site or what people will find there? Well, um, what I'd certainly like to add is that this event, it's available um, at, at thefinaledition.com and also on uh, CD Baby, um, which, um, uh, which, uh, which, which has it on, will we'll have it on a number of other sites, but it, it's, uh, it's also available on iTunes, and um, it's real cheap, so buy it. Okay. All right. Thanks again, Tony. Very much appreciate it. Okay. Thank you, James. Great fun. Bye. Bye.